So I'll, I'll be very brief, but of course I just uh, So actually, Bert, we were, had been planning to present this last night, but I think it was our mistake that we didn't really catch up with you at the Energy and Fuels dinner. And um, or, or actually, even probably formally invite you along. I guess we just assumed it. So that's our mistake, for which I apologize. But anyway, this morning we had the chance to do this in front of your colleagues here. And uh, uh, Bert, of course, uh, as you all know, is very distinguished. He's been around a very long time in this field, and we've got three days of symposium to uh, attest to all of that. So uh, it is an award of division, and we, it, it's an official award, and we have an official plaque that I'd like to present to Bert. And uh, perhaps we can in take a picture of in front of that yeah. Um, yeah. backdrop, uh, which is very appropriate. So you might want to Use the f yeah. I think I think we need to move out of the backdrop there. Can you just come a little? Yeah. Yeah. from the University of Witzwatersrand in Johannesburg, South Africa. And uh, he, uh, he now is on the faculty at the University of South Africa in uh, Johannesburg. He spent a number of months in our laboratory during his PhD work, and the focus of his research has been on how VLE impacts the FT product distribution. The title of his paper is Study of Fischer-Tropsch Synthesis in a Tank Reactor at CSTR and Batch Modes with Titania-Supported Cobalt Catalyst. And the co-authors are Xiaojin Lu and Professors Diane Hildebrand and Glasser. Thank you, Chairperson, uh, for the opportunity for me to present here. And uh, Professor Diane Herbrand and Professor Klaus would also like to congratulate Beth on the prestigious award. So what I'm going to be presenting here is the work that has been done at the University of the Wittrotas Rand uh, in Johannesburg. Although our whole group has already moved, now we are with the University of Salome. So. Uh, the fischer tropsch synthesis has been around for quite a while <clears throat> and uh, I think uh, it has fascinated a lot of people for a long time and I think Beth is one of the, pe one of the people that has been fascinated by this uh, synthesis. So, but then despite being, having been studied for a very long time, even up to this day, there's no simple explanation for what is happening that somebody can just give you a brief summary. You find that people find different results from different researchers, you find different results from different catalysts. 
and the results are usually complex and uh, confusing. So, but then um, maybe we, we need an alternative view. Maybe the complexity is, is not just only due to reaction mechanism. But if you just only study reaction mechanism, you won't get the whole picture. So maybe the complexity is caused by like a combination of uh, phenomena. The phenomena themselves might be simple, but then the interaction between them might be uh, complex and sometimes counterintuitive. So here we might have some catalytic effects and some reaction kinetic issue and phase equilibrium, of which yeah, uh, my focus is mainly on the phase equilibrium. <coughs> So as I've said, the individual phenomena might not be that complex, although they might be complex in themselves, but then uh, to some extent, some people you can get a grasp of it, but then the interaction between them uh, could be uh, very complicated. So the question is, could this be the case for the fissure trough range? <coughs> and to try uh, get a little bit of understanding in that, oh, we conducted the, the experiment most people conduct experiments on a, either on a CSTR, be it a gas phase or slurry phase. So very few experiments have been conducted in a batch mode. But then we thought, let's look at batch mode and see what kind of results that we can get from that. So <clears throat> the aspects that we've been that we're gonna try to present at this time is. Uh, looking at the liquid deposit on the catalyst because the CSTR that we've been running is supposed to be gas phase, but then uh, you might find that uh, liquid does deposit into your catalyst. So that's one the thing that we're going to be looking at. And uh, to some extent, while we're doing some experiment, we find that there might be oxidation of the cobalt catalyst. Uh, meanwhile, we have a reaction. So we look at that and look at its regeneration. And uh, one of the things that ha has been puzzling me for a little while is the phase of water in the FT reaction. In the past, mo most people have assumed that you, your water will be in the gas phase, and that was the initial assumption that we have. But then, after having done some few experiments, uh, you find that the results are not what you'd expect. So then, uh, we have to try to investigate further as to in what phase is the water. So, what we have was a simple. Uh, Reactor bought from uh, autoclave. So when you buy from autoclave, it says uh, it's a CSTR, but then we ran it in a CSTR mode, we ran it in batch mode, and we even done a uh, flushing experiment on the same system. And um, okay, it is a CSTR. We, we showed that if you change the space velocity, if you've got, I mean, if you change the stirring speed, once your stirring speed is above 65 uh, RPM, then it's a good CSTR. So, uh, most of our experiments, we use the stirring speed that is greater than 100. <coughs> and um, this is basic for most of you uh, here, they are familiar with the uh, Fischer troughs. So we use the supported copper catalyst, we use titania as a support. Um, most of it is pretty standard 20 bar pressure, 3 pm loaded, we varied the temperature, but then kept the space velocity constant. And our feed was a 2 to 1 ratio. Uh, seen here yes, that had uh, nitrogen for mass balance purposes. Um, as I've said, the, the reactor itself is supposed to be gas phase, so we ran that uh, the gas solid uh, regime, but then we, we didn't just only run it uh, the way it was specified the when we bought it. We ran the CSTR as was specified, but then we also ran batch mode where we closed both the inlet and the outlet. We only charge the reactor and then close. And also ran flushing, like after you ran your experiments, you replace your gas and then flush with either nitrogen or alcohol. And uh, <coughs> in the CSTR mode, okay, this is just a simplified diagram. Uh, you have your sink gas coming in and a product uh, going down there. And we use that for gas phase sampling and uh, we record the, da the data from the beginning. And one of the fascinating things is that, okay, with fission drop, we loaded the catalyst, started the run, and you could see uh, your CO uh, conversion go up to a certain value, and uh, after a few hours, it seems to be a little bit stable right there. And we didn't do anything to the reactor, didn't change anything, but then after around 25 hours, we started noticing a drop in the conversion. 
okay, you might think maybe uh, something happened or that was a, a fluke. Then you do another experiment, you get the same type of results. So then, and you haven't changed anything. Okay, initially we had a uh, methane selectivity around 5%. You think, wow, this is a great catalyst. And then after 24 hours, that's that, uh, changing. And we haven't changed anything in the setting. So then now we look at the results themselves, like the olefin to paraffin ratio. They show a very high olefin to paraffin ratio at the beginning, and then after when the, the conversion start dropping, the olefin to paraffin ratio start changing as well. So then that's uh, another thing that wow, that is fascinating, and we don't know what's causing this. And the main question is why do you have some sort of a, a stable period for a short time and then start dropping? And now, uh, to try and understand that, we said, okay, let's have a flashing experiment. So we we'll run the experiment at, up to the point where it's stable, and then it drops again. And then after it drops, then we'll flash uh, with nitrogen. So then we run the experiment, and then after the period where it sort of stabilizes at the low temperature, we we'll flash with the uh, nitrogen. And at this point, we we'll flash at 190 degrees C. And then to some extent we saw a slight improvement in terms of the conversion, but then it stabilized again to the same point. We thought, okay, maybe 190 was a lower temperature. So then now we flash at a different temperature. We said, okay, let's flash at 230 degrees. And then we flash at 230 degrees, we saw some improvement in the CO conversion, and after a while it came back down again to the same uh, stable condition it was. So now we say, okay, let's try an intermediate uh, temperature. We flash at 210 degrees, it goes up uh, slightly, and then it goes back again. <coughs> so then uh, we, we saw that if you flash at a slight high temperature, your reaction rate actually does go up to almost similar to what you had at the beginning, but then it drops back again. So the same with the flashing experiments, now look at the olefin to paraffin ratio similar uh, behavior was observed is that initially you had a very high olefin to paraffin ratio here I'm only showing a C2, C3 and C4 and then if you flash at 230 this is what you have at two, at, this is 190, flash at 230 this is what you have so to some extent uh, the flashing experiment does show you that if you flash your catalyst somehow it does get uh, back to what you had when you had a fresh catalyst. So after at the end of the flashing experiment, we took out the catalyst to try to analyze it to see what what's on the catalyst in terms of the works that usually remains at the end of your results. And this one it shows that uh, the catalyst that we haven't flashed, this is the type of product distribution you get at the end of the results. And after flashing, this is the type of uh, results that you have. And to some extent, this shows that uh, it, the liquid that is deposited on the catalyst does affect uh, your performance in terms of your conversion and also your product distribution. Because the flashing experiment does show that uh, some of the light hydrocarbons do get flushed out, and then that's why maybe you have uh, some of the uh, olefin to paraffin ratio going up again and then back down again. So now we. Do, we did more experiment. Uh, we started the reactor CSTR mode, and then now we switched the syngas and the product uh, off to run our reactor in the batch mode. <coughs> and then at the end of the batch experiment, uh, then we analyzed the, the product. And uh, one of the <laughs> things that we didn't expect, we found that there was some CO2 that we observed that the, at the end of the Batch results. So then, um, the question is, what is happening? We have a CSTR that's running with no CO2, and then you change, you run your batch mode, you get some CO2, and then if you change again back to CSTR, your CO2 drops. And then, um, one thing that we know about the Fischer drop is that you form a lot of water. So if you try to take your Fischer Trop uh, uh, product and you use an average carbon number, if your average carbon number is C10, then you can show that for every mole of CO that you use, you, pr 
produce one mole of uh, water. And then uh, for the C10, that would be equivalent of 0.1 mole. So to some extent, as I said, even the other previous days, uh, FT, the main product for official shop is water. It looks like the fuels and the rest are just like a side product. So then um, the question is then, um, is this the water that is oxidizing the catalyst or what? But then uh, we believe that this water is probably oxidizing the catalyst. Because uh, when you have the, a batch mode, you have a very high conversion, and therefore the partial pressure of water is very high. And the other thing, when we run the batch experiments, if you need the same gas, you've got your CO and hydrogen and going to your product. And you have like three moles of gas going to like um, one and a half mole or one and something moles of gas. So you have a slight decrease in terms of the moles. And we recorded the pressure readings from the experiment. So um, we started 20 bar, uh, normal CSCR and a normal experiment. And then if you switch off the, both the feed and the gas, the reaction still continue uh, going on. And then the, the pressure drops because your number of gas, the gas modes is decreasing. And this is the type of uh, behavior that we observe. And this is consistent with what we expected, is that if you were running at a high temperature, your pressure drops quickly, but then it stabilizes at a higher point. That's because you have a higher reaction rate. If you have a low temperature, your drop is a bit slower, but then at the end of the day, we have a, a lower pressure at the end. So now uh, we look at the CO conversion while we're running the bench mode. We're running at the uh, conversion somewhere around 20. You switch off both your feed and your product, and then you can see your conversion picks up and it gets uh, very close to 100% uh, conversion. And then if you do your pressure that corresponds with the uh, conversion there, you can uh, take the measurement from the pressure reading and you plot it there as well. But then now we're trying to see uh, the phase of water as to in what phase is it in. Because uh, if you do some of the modeling or calculation, trying to see if the water is in the vapor phase or the liquid phase. Most in the past people have assumed that it's in the vapor phase. But then when we are doing the modeling, some, somewhere somehow it didn't uh, correspond well. So at this point, uh, we consider uh, water in the vapor phase, but then for a product, we only consider methane. You can show that uh, the results are still consistent, even though you consider more product. So then if you do that, you can see that if all the water is in the vapor phase, this is the type of uh, pressure curve that we'd expect. This is from the, most of the compound, you can do that from the mass balance, and you, if you assume ideal gas, then you can work out the <coughs> pressure from, for the whole system. And this is what you'd expect to have if all the water was in the vapor phase. And then now, if you assume that all the water is in the liquid phase, that the gas phase is only the other hydrocarbons, this is the curve that you expect to have. So to some extent, uh, this to, to me says that not all your water is in the gas phase, because if it were, then you'd have that curve. And the other thing is that not all your water is in the liquid phase, because if that was the case, this is the curve that you'd have. So then there must be some of the water in the vapor phase and some of it in the liquid phase. So now, uh, when we are running the batch experiment, we, we were taking sample at different uh, times and including the, the vapor and we are analyzing that in the GC. So here is a table that shows, okay, we could analyze up to C8, but then my main focus here is the water. If you analyze the water from the vapor phase, you can see that, okay, uh, at 190, uh, uh, the partial pressure of water is about uh, 0.64. If you go up to 220, two. And the important thing is that this system is relatively accurate because if you calculate your total uh, pressure that we expect for the system, it would be somewhere around 7.11, that's at 190. And the pressure reading that we can read from the manometer in the reactor is like 7.15. So this is relatively accurate. Even though the system was not set up to do all those VLE calculations and things like that, but then we could get accurate results from it. 
So now, uh, just to uh, come back, just only the water and neglecting the other stuff, is that <coughs> this the if you analyze your, your, your vapor phase, this is the partial pressure of water that you have. But then, if you were to assume that all your water is in the vapor phase, this is what you would expect to have, of which that's not the case. So from this, we can work out how much uh, fraction of water will be in the gas phase uh, by comparing the two. And this is what you have expect. If you can check that at a lower temperature, you can see that uh, the, the fraction of water is around uh, 13. If you increase the temperature in the gas phase, your fraction of water in the gas phase increases. But this is expected because if you increase your temperatures, then you vaporize more of the stuff. So to some extent, this is what you would expect. <coughs> so now uh, we we try uh, doing more experiments to get uh, more insight into what is actually happening. Okay, I've already explained uh, most of this. And then now we did the same experiment for the CSTR to try to analyze how much uh, fraction of the water is in the gas phase. Just as I explained before, this is what you expect. So now, if you try to plot the two together, and uh, your results, in fact, they match. What the amount of water you find in the vapor phase or in the liquid phase for your batch mode, compared to that with the one you find for the CSTR mode, they are roughly the same. And uh, this curve is consistent with vapor equilibrium, that if you have a lower uh, temperature, you have uh, more water in the liquid phase, if you have a high temperature, then more water will be in the vapor phase. <coughs> so now uh, we did the flushing experiment. So we run your reactor, CSTR mode, or batch mode, or batch mode, and then at the end, you replace your gas with argon, and then you try flushing with the uh, argon. And then, at the end of the experiment, after we done, we flush with argon and we observe some of the, the water coming out. And this is at 190. And then you change the temperature and you can see that there's less water that can flush out from the liquid phase. And what this says is that uh, at the lower temperature, you can flush out more water, which was remaining in the liquid phase. This just only serves to confirm what we had before uh, in the previous slide. <coughs> And then the fraction of water still the same as uh, what, what, what you had before. So the experimental results, they do show that a uh, considerable proportion of your water is in the liquid phase. So if you're running a CSTR, there's supposed to be a gas phase uh, CSTR. You do have your liquid that is deposited on the catalyst. And on top of that, you have water in that liquid phase. So it's not just only a pure hydrocarbon phase. Now, the next question is that uh, if water is in the liquid phase, uh, does it form a separate uh, liquid phase such that you have two liquid phases, or is it the same liquid phase that has, li that has hydrocarbons and water? So then that's the next question that uh, we're going to be looking at. And uh, we don't even have an equilibrium cell. And in Germany, they used to do a little bit of vapor liquid equilibrium in the past, and somewhere, somehow they stopped. I don't understand why, but then um, we just took a simple um, CSTR, we ran it, we tried to find the information on the VLE, and to some extent we did show that you do have a VLE even what, when you expected gas phase. So, but then now to say, okay, let's try uh, do this in a different way. We know that you can have a low alpha if you're running CO2. So then now we had a CO2 experiment to see if we would have a phase with the water. So we ran our CO2 uh, hydrogenation. The alpha is low as you expected, very high uh, methane uh, selectivity. And then uh, we switched the reactor from CSTR to batch, to batch mode. We record the pressure as we expect, and this is the curve that we have. And then uh, we calculate the pressure if all the water was in the vapor phase, and this is the point that we have. So then if you have a very low alpha, you expect all your products to be in the vapor phase, and to some extent that is uh, the case. <coughs> so then uh, what we've shown is that with a very simple uh, experimental setup, a little bit of creativity, we can get a lot of, ex uh, lot of results.
that you can, can try to share more lights in terms of FT. And we provided another way of looking at FT that you can, we don't just only need to run uh, CSTR or slurries, you can also run batch mode and even flashing experiments. And to some extent, I, I know that in the, some previous speakers have explained some of the phenomena with uh, surface reconstruction, that might be possible, but I think we need to have an integrated uh, view of the whole picture. Because if you try to look at one aspect and forget the other ones, then you don't get the whole picture as to what is happening. So this provides another way of looking at it. That the deposit of liquid does change your conversion, it drops it, and it also changes your all thing to paraffin ratio. And uh, uh, there is a significant amount of water in your <coughs> in the liquid phase, rather than just only in the vapor phase, as was expected before. And um, and uh, when we changed to batch mode, we found that you can form uh, CO two to some extent. That suggests that uh, your Catalyst has been oxidized, of which therefore it becomes active for the water gas shift, and that's why we have the CO2. But that one is, uh, can be reversed because if you switch back to uh, syn gas condition, then that CO2 uh, disappears. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, 3 and NRF for funding and some of the guys for the experimental setting. And thank you for your time and your attention. Questions? I might miss this at the beginning, but um, what is the relative volume of the gas to pour, uh, the, the volume of gas to internal pores in, in the system? Because I, I, I'm trying to get a feel for what is the total residence time for gas, you know, you're given a space velocity, but I was curious if that was a parameter that can be looked at. Well, I can look at that, but I haven't looked at it now, but I can try to calculate the relative volume. Well, you're in the CSTR, so you're going to have some residual uh, resonance time in the gas phase. So it, uh, I'm trying to get a feel. Is the gas phase 10 times greater than the core volume? I, I didn't quite. In your the mechanical setup of the system. I haven't calculated that. Okay. Yeah, but I can try to get it. It should, should be pretty simple if you have a catalytic weight, you know, even if you assume it's 4 volume, 4 volume 15 or 0.5 or something, and you have a PFTR size, it seems to me it's probably pretty obvious. Yeah. 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 I, I guess the thing with the dynamic testing, if you look at the, uh, if you vary the ratio of gas to 4 volume, it might help uh, sort out the, uh, you know, your secondary reaction. It's 100 mil. It's 100 mil. So there's a lot of gas. There's a lot of resonance on the gas. Okay. Um, let's thank our speaker once again. Oh, we got one more question. Professor Phillips. I'm astonished about the high polyfin to paraffin ratio you initially have. Yeah? These are the primary products. IP, obviously, you then have no secondary reaction initially. You directly get the primary products activity. It must be something like that. Because normally with scope catalysts, you always have a rather high paraffin to polyfin ratio due to the secondary reactions. So I was astonished about your high well, that was not necessarily my explanation, but uh, I think it, it, it does explain explain the, the result that your, your primary product is what you form in the beginning, and then once you have the liquid, then that enhances the re yeah, adsorption and that changes. Yeah, it extracts them yeah, uh, from the reaction situation yeah, to get them. Which is normally not the case. Okay, thanks. Okay, let's thank Cornelius uh, once again. The, uh, the next speaker. Uh,
was unable to come, Professor Jin Lin Lee. He worked uh, at our laboratory for a number of years. Um, he just was promoted to president of his university, so he, he's very, very busy. So um, in place, what we're going to do is we're going to play a few of uh, Bert's video interviews uh, with um, some of the you know well-known names in Catalysis. And we'll see if we can get this uh, audio to work. Emma R.E. is a PhD student at University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon. And she's working with Professor Delay, who uh, spent some time on sabbatical at our center. The uh, title of her talk is Synthesis and Characterization of CNHs for Hydrotreating of Gas Oils. And the co-authors are Professor Delay, John Ajay, and John Ajay of Syncrude Canada and Edmonton. Good morning, everyone. So I'd like to thank the Division of Energy and Forum for giving